then the occupation of Afghanistan by the Red Army and the Soviet Union, then a long period of bloody civil war, then the rule by the Taliban for about four years, and then a period of two decades of occupation by the United States. As all of you know, the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan a few weeks ago. Taliban have essentially taken over Afghanistan. Uh, today, tonight, we are not going to talk about American policy toward Afghanistan. We are going to focus on internal politics of Afghanistan with a focus on the Taliban and, and of course, the status of women. But before I introduce our uh, distinguished guest, let me just give you some uh, interesting statistics so that you have a better appreciation of what is going on in Afghanistan. Uh, in the 20 years that the U.S. occupied Afghanistan, we had the longest American war in the history of this country. The total cost of two decades of occupation was $2.3 trillion. That means, according to President Biden, $300 million a day of taxpayers' money for 20 years. Let me repeat that again. $300 million a day for 20 years. And here are the casualties. Altogether, 176,000 people were killed in two decades. Of those, 2,300, 2,324, to be precise, for U.S. military personnel, 3,900 for U.S. contractors, 69,000 for Afghan military and police, 46,000 were civilians, and 52,893 were fighters of Taliban. And now, after all of that uh, casualties and expenses, the Taliban are once again in power in Afghanistan. Before I introduce the two speakers, I want to uh, express my gratitude to the members of our board of directors, to uh, the Honorable Raymond Gross, who chairs our advisory committee, uh, to uh, Mr. Ted Wilhite, to Mr. Stephen Mitchell, Mr. Gene Engels, uh, Charlie Stryker, uh, Dr. Stamps, uh, Dr. Kellen Holbrook, and Mr. Barry Albert. And uh, now let me uh, introduce our two speakers. The first is Dr. Professor Nazif Shahrani. I have to uh, make a confession. And the confession is that when I was a uh, young and aspiring PhD student at the uh, University of South Florida, uh, Professor Shahrani, and I'm not revealing his age, I'm just telling you, Professor Shahrani was a professor at uh, University of California in Los Angeles. And at that time, I had the pleasure and the honor of knowing him, and it has been a great friendship. Uh, he has been to our campus a couple of times as uh, the guest of our center, and he really is, in my judgment, uh, one of the most authoritative uh, scholars of modern Afghanistan. He is professor of anthropology, Central Asian and Middle Eastern studies at Indiana University. He has served two terms as chairman uh, uh, of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Culture. And for that, I give him my condolences. <laughs> uh, he is an Afghan American anthropologist with extensive field research in Afghanistan and has studied Afghan refugee communities in Pakistan and Turkey since 1992 
He has conducted field research in post-Soviet republics of uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. He specializes in political anthropology, and he has studied religion with a focus on Islam. Uh, he began his studies at the Kabul University in Afghanistan, completed his BA at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. His MA and PhD degrees are from University of Washington in Seattle. And as I said before, joining Indiana University in 1990, he was teaching at the University of California, at Los Angeles. He uh, has written extensively. Some of his most recent publications are Modern Afghanistan, The Impact of 40 Years of War, Revolutions and Rebellion in Afghanistan. And he has written a number of articles in some of the most prestigious and peer reviewed uh, uh, journals. It is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to our conversation. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Tabassum Niru. Uh, I call her doctor because she either has the PhD in hand or is about to get her PhD. But as far as I'm concerned, she has well achieved, accomplished and therefore she deserves to be called doctor. Uh, uh, she is getting her PhD from in education uh, at Old Dominion University. Uh, uh, her publications are around higher education policies in developing countries and uh, Afghan women's extensive uh, uh, culture, expressive culture. Previously, she worked as a government official in Afghanistan. She is a Fulbright, an international peace scholar. And I was looking at her uh, uh, publications, and I can see that she has four uh, refereed articles already. And for someone uh, who just is getting her PhD, to have four refereed articles in uh, some of the most prestigious academic journal is uh, a great accomplishment. I welcome you to our program uh, on Metabasu. Um, let me first start uh, by uh, Professor Shahrani. And the question I want to ask uh, Professor Shahrani is to give a short uh, description or uh, short analysis of the ethnic diversity of Afghanistan before we talk about Taliban. Please educate the audience about the cultural diversity in Afghanistan, please. Assalamu alaikum uh, to everyone and good evening. And thank you very, very much, my good friend, Dr. Mohsin Milani, for a very uh, elaborate uh, introduction. And also, I want to express my gratitude to the uh, Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies at the University of South Florida. Um, and of course, this is an honor to be invited this evening to participate in this conversation with you. Let me um, share screen and um, uh, show something that uh, will help, I think, understand our really, uh, the ethnic composition of Afghanistan. Let me give you an extremely brief, um, this is an honor, uh, history of Afghanistan in, in, a, in a nutshell, really. Uh, if you look at this map here in the uh, left corner, in the upper uh, side, you'll see there was Safavid Empire, which became the Afsharid Empire later on in the Mughal Empire. Both of them were essentially fighting for Kandahar in the region around there. In uh, 1747, um, the Afsharid king was assassinated near Mashhad, and his uh, 4,000 strong Afghan contingent who looked after him, and the man who led that contingent was a Pashtun from Kandahar named uh, Ahmad Khan. And he became Ahmad Khan Durrani, and he created this empire that lasted from 1747 to 1826. And then the um, uh, 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 problem essentially 
came into this map here, the British essentially occupied Indian subcontinent and went against this, uh, the Rani Pashtun Empire. Russian Tsarist empires were also uh, coming down south and they had taken uh, much of Central Asia. In the second war, the British essentially went into Kabul for the second time and invaded it and then tried to create a buffer state. And that buffer state was this state that you see in the red, uh, essentially reducing this empire into that. And even the story of the Wakhan Corridor, the little thing that sticks out where I spent two years of my life, uh, was really given a force to, for Afghanistan for this guy, uh, Amir Abdurrahman, who uh, ruled this country from 1880 to 1901. Uh, he was bribed essentially to accept that. And the reason for that was for the two empires, the British and Tsarist Empire should not have common borders. And it was literally buffer, a wall that they created that they named Afghanistan. And they also, the British drew all the maps, all the border lines in Afghanistan. So here, and they divided up every ethnic group that uh, surrounds Afghanistan that they constructed. If you look at this little strip, the other side is Turkmenistan today. They drew the line a little bit down. They could have drawn the line, I mean, further down and had all the Turkmen on the other side, but they purposefully divided the Turkmen and kept this little strip of it uh, inside the buffer state of Afghanistan. The brown areas or Uzbekistan up here. So the Uzbeks are divided and kept some of them in Afghanistan and some of course were occupied by the Russian empire at that point. And the um, purple color represents the Tajiks. So the Tajiks were divided. Tajikistan now is a country out here and they were divided uh, uh, into two halves, some left within Afghanistan and some on the other side. They also, and of course, these particular uh, uh, borders were drawn between British India and Tsarist Russia. Afghans had nothing to do with it, including the Wakhan Corridor. There is about 70 uh, kilometers uh, contact with uh, China. China did not actually deal with that until 1967. China recognized that border. Before that, it wasn't. And then this long 1,200 miles thing, uh, the British themselves drew this. This is called the Durand Line. They divided the Pashtun into half. So the best lands, irrigated and well uh, wealthy, were kept within British India, which is now Northwest Pakistan or Pakhtunkhwa, and then the rest of it in the east. These are the Ghalzai Pashtuns. In this end, and the Durrani Pashtuns, the Amatra and also Abdurrahman Khan tribe are the Pashtuns here. If you look down here, the deep blue, these are the Baluchs. So Baluch are divided again between uh, British India and Iran. Some of the Baluch were kept in Iran, some were kept within the British India, which is now part of Pakistan, Baluchistan, and then some Baluch were left within Afghanistan. The only ethnic group that were contained within Afghanistan were the Hazara Shias, right here in central Afghanistan. And of course, Abdurrahman did such a job on them, calling them Kafir, and of course, fighting against everybody who stuck, stuck their hand out. About 500,000 of them were driven out of the country to Quetta in Pakistan or to Mashhad, and the rest was, uh, most of them were sold as slaves in the markets in Afghanistan. So this is, this is the ethnic composition of Afghan society until today. it for the audience, would it be accurate to say that there are four major ethnic groups, the Uzbeks, the Tajiks, the Hazaras, and the Pashtuns. These yes. are the main ethnic groups in Afghanistan. Right. And there are some more, some more ethnic and linguistic groups that are smaller. Yes, but the main one, these are. All right, I'll, we'll come back to 
the Taliban in a second. Let me now go to uh, our other guest and ask her, uh, as Tabassum Hanum, to talk about uh, the status of women before uh, uh, the rise of Taliban. And I, in my conversation be her, uh, with her, she was telling me that uh, the West usually has a very narrow understanding of the status of women in Afghanistan because they often focus on women in urban areas and only in large urban areas. So, Ms. Tabassum, welcome to the program. Uh, please Thank tell us about much. the status of women. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I uh, I understand that you are asking me about the first rise of the Taliban, right? Or the second rise of the Taliban? Second first, time. first one. The first one. Yes. The first, before the Taliban, um, the, the women's status was um, also fragile because the Mujahideen and the civil war distracted everything that women had achieved during the Russian-backed government in Afghanistan. And particularly, it was in Kabul. Again, I should mention that there are a lot of stories I see on social media on people's talks that, oh, how women were in the 60s in Afghanistan. But that was only in Kabul, I should say. And Professor Shahrani can correct me on that. Uh, women were very much liberated. Women were very much educated. Women were, uh, women were very much equal in the society, uh, more or less. But it was mostly in Kabul. And that was during the Russian-backed regime and a little bit earlier. However, after that, then the civil war began, uh, and then during the civil war, everyone got um, changed, Every, everything got changed, and women's status turned upside down with um, having um, so many uh, educated population fleeing the country, and only those who remained that um, did not find a way to leave the country, or some of us, like my father, were very much patriot, and they wanted to stay in the country no matter what. Um, the civil war left millions of women without a um, without husbands, and their sons were also uh, taken to the war, and they came back dead. They didn't return alive, I mean to say. So there were a lot of now these women in the rural areas were left without um, without a family protector, without a family supporter, because traditionally in Afghanistan, again aside from Kabul, mostly it's women's job to um, to be the breadwinner. Now the men were uh, recruited by force. Um, young boys were recruited to fight uh, with Mujahideen in different factions uh, in different parts of the country by force. And they kept losing their husbands and their sons and there was no one left at home to, um, to, to help with their agriculture and to be the breadwinner of the family. So that, that changed the narrative of Afghan women um, dramatically, meaning Afghan women became victim Afghan women um, try, uh, start to be represented as a um, helpless shadows, as uh, as poor uh, and as as um, oppressed, and every negative labels um, in the world. Now, the Taliban even made it worse because the Taliban, um, the brutal, the first rise of the, the Taliban, um, they started killing men. They um, there was no job in. Um, the hands were chopped off if men were stealing because there was no job. And there were women who actually had to do prostitution because there was nothing else. There was no hope. There was no way. Women were not allowed to work. As everybody knows, women were not allowed to go out alone. Uh, there has to be a male member. If no male member, there has to be one person with it. And women were stoned to death in public only by guessing that this woman was immoral. By uh, accusing women to adultery, they were publicly executed. And Kabul Stadium, everyone remembers that, I'm, I'm sure. It was the, the biggest execution places for women as, and men as well. They were shot in the head in public, just to make an example for other women. And everyone was scared by that. And I was a teenager when the Taliban came. We were back in Mazar Sharif. And in Mazar Sharif, they went they occupied the country overall later on in 1980, I guess, or 90. Then, as a teenager, I think for me, it was so hard to wear the burqa, the blue burqa, to practice wearing it, to practice walking with it outside. And 
sitting at home, uh, uh, just, just, you know, waiting for fine marriages. Every woman's job was actually waiting for fine marriages. And usually they would prefer marriages that they were outside of the country, at least that they could pick out the woman um, to be outside. And women, in a way, happen to be burdens in the family. Unfortunately, I feel bad to say that, but that, is the, that, that was the case because there was nothing else except doing the house chores and sitting at home. Um, that was it. So that was the oppressive and the dark period of women. However, then there was another story of women uh, that women had in w within the houses because there was no school, no job. Women had a lot of fun among themselves. There was a stronger community then because people could meet each other quite often and women could connect with each other. The community was a little broadened and there were women coming and sitting with each other, talking about each other, you know, playing the daira, singing and making jokes and everything. And a lot focused about fashion. The Titanic movie was coming, came out at that point and that got very important. When it comes to um, civil society, during the first round of the Taliban, it was the days of, of course, women's rights, human rights, women's civil society. There was no such thing. However, there were women individually working as teachers. For instance, we, uh, my sisters and I, had secret schools at home because my younger sister was kept, uh, was, was kept chasing by the Taliban, and she often came pale face at home. And so we had this secret school in our apartment in Kabul, so we could teach also other girls and keep ourselves occupied a little bit. There were other women teaching English a little, not in a sophisticated level, but hi, how are you, what's your name? Because there were a lot of younger women marrying to this young man uh, in the Western or European countries, and they were all going outside abroad, and they were preparing for their English lessons. At least they could communicate when they first arrived or they first reached to their husband that sometimes they never saw. So that was the overall the sum of the women's circumstances um, in the first round of the Taliban. Um, but I should say that there was life going on. Yes, um, there were women executed, tortured, but also life was going on. And, and, and me, people were trying to find their way to be happy. Yes, please. Let me, let me interrupt you and ask you a, a question. And I know that uh, you cannot give a definitive answer because I don't think we, anybody has surveyed this. But before uh, Republic was created, during the Tsar Shah period, when we had monarchy, you have to guess what percentage of Afghan women were whale, what percentage were not. Just a rough, rough estimate. I would say 5%, even lesser than that. If I am generous, I would say 5%. And again, that was Kabul. In other words, 95% the veil. Yes. And even in Kabul, even in Kabul, I do see pictures. And according to my research, there are women, even back then, uh, many, many women with burqas. Yes, there were women with uh, mini skirts, uh, sleeveless shirts, not, let alone having the head scarf. But yes. Along them, you, you would see a lot of women with, with, with the blue burqas as well. Excellent. Uh, let me just quickly uh, make three comments. Number one is that uh, my wife always tells me not to read from uh, your note. because I get confused. Uh, and as I was introducing members uh, of our board of directors, I forgot to mention Mr. Sam Bell as a... Uh, distinguished member of our board, so if you're watching me, please accept my apologies for getting you. The second issue is that if you have any questions, please send your questions and they will come to me. And after about half an hour, I'm going to ask our two distinguished guests to address them. And finally, I'm going to ask both of our guests to be a little bit shorter because I have Large, good number of questions, and I don't want to miss. I want to go back to uh, Dr. Sharani. Now, in terms of uh, ethnic diversity, tell us uh, as briefly as you can, who are the Taliban? Where do they come from? Okay, I want to draw your attention to this map. During the war against the Soviet Union, um, uh, much of the uh, resistance 
got consolidated in terms of ethnic structure. So just about 1995, people of Persian, people of Persian speaker in Western Afghanistan, five provinces got essentially consolidated into a unit that was headed by Ismail Khan, Amir Ismail Khan. And five provinces up here in the Northwest, they are primarily Turkic speaking Uzbeks. Uh, they got consolidated under uh, General uh, Dustum, which now has become Marshal Dustum. Hazaras in central Afghanistan created and consolidated their own political um, uh, structure, essentially. The Pashtuns in the east, mostly Ghilzai Pashtuns, that in Paktika, Paktika, Nangarhar, and so forth, also created their own council. And they were doing pretty darn well. And then the, this part of the country, very large areas, mixed, Uzbeks and Tajiks and others, they were run by essentially the of Ahmad Shah Massoud of Ahmad and, Shah President Masood Rabbani. and President Rabbani. So what was left was so this was large left area of Pashtun Doranis around here. Durani's it around was here. a chaos. It was a chaos. Particularly in Kandahar. They couldn't get Kandahar. themselves they together. They were fighting together. They amongst were fighting themselves in a mess. Themselves in a mess. And, they and also everybody is fighting also everybody over is Kabul, fighting the capital. over Kabul, the capital. So 1995, so 1995, right here, the Taliban comes into existence. Comes into existence. Mullah Omar, essentially, Mullah with his, essentially with Mullahs, his 17 soldiers, 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 rise against these rise pity, against these pity uh, uh, local, uh, leaders, local leaders, local leaders, local commanders, leaders, local commanders, leaders, and, local commanders, and, commanders, and, local commanders, local local commanders local and, commander and gets rid of one of them and hangs them on the front of a cannon and so on. So, a cannon so that's so the, rise so that's the rise of Pashtun Taliban in Kandahar Pashtun region. In Kandahar and fr region. From then on, from ISI then on, essentially takes ISI hold of essentially this takes movement, hold of this turns movement, it into. Taliban to and of Taliban course, uh, goes, and of on course uh, goes on to Iraq, conquering first Iraq, dislodging uh, uh, this logic uh, uh, Ismail Khan uh, and then goes Khan, against Dustum and then goes against, and goes against Dustum, Kabul and goes against and Kabul uh, essentially uh, that's essentially where that's we essentially where had we essentially uh, had consolidation uh, of the consolidation of the country ethnic, in terms of structure ethnic, by itself structure, if you like by itself um, if you like naturally um, into naturally, Afghanistan if into Afghanistan that Taliban consolidated the, the Pashtuns, Pashtuns in the West, the, the Pashtuns in the West, the and they had agreed into some and kind of federal into structure, some kind of federal structure, uh, and Kabul uh, would have settled and down. Kabul the country should down. not have had the country should not have had war. But unfortunately, war. that's but not what happened. That's not and, what happened. And, um, the Taliban and, um, were encouraged the Taliban to go and conquer the rest of the country. So that's that's where we are today. That's where we are today. What Pashtuns are essentially, well, Pashtuns um, are essentially related um, very closely related to very Indo Iranian speakers. Indo Iranian speakers. The language is very close to Persian and earlier uh, Persianate language and culture. But culturally, they are oriented more towards Indian subcontinent because of the orientation. You know, all the invasions earlier on from Afghanistan was directed against India. So that they're culturally more uh, South Asian uh, than uh, Central Asian or Iranian in the in the uh, current sense, but they are tribal people. They are the most tribally organized people in Afghanistan, and that there are two major factions of uh, Pashtun tribes: the Ghilzai or the Eastern Pashtuns, and the Durrani or the Western Pashtuns. Western Pashtuns have been dominating pol politics in Afghanistan for a very long time, and of course in a competition with Ghilzais. And during the last 40 years, it has sort of gone back and forth. The Ghilzais took the upper hand through the communist revolution. And they have also, uh, during the Taliban, some Ghilzais became very prominent. prominent. Right now, the Haqqani group, or the sort of the faction that is the most terrorist, uh, and in the current government, or also Eastern Pashtuns. But uh, Mullah Bradar and uh, Yaqub and others are Kandaharis. So the Western Pashtuns, there are both tensions and collaboration and coexistence against others, but internally also very divided, tribally organized.
let's go back to the 20 years uh, which the U.S. was in Afghanistan. We uh, uh, hear a lot about how Afghan civil society grew during this period. No uh, matter of fact that Women were allowed to be educated, really had a very vibrant civil society. Now, focusing again on the status of women, how do you define that status during those two decades of American occupation compared to what we had during civil war or during the Taliban? Sure. Before I begin, I'd like to ask Professor Shahrani to share the first slide, because that explains nearly everything, and I would have my own anecdotes. So, excuse me, the 20 years, um, I call the 20 years, quote-unquote, the golden era of Afghanistan. Uh, of course, af after all this, the Taliban era and the civil war and all the chaos. On they returned, and so they were contributing a lot in the enrollment of education, higher education, and also um, the job uh, field. However, I would say again, this limited all these gains. Um, U.S. narratives focus a lot about um, gains of women, gains that women have made in the past 20 years. That was again limited, very much limited to urban areas, and particularly to the. Um, to the capital, uh, Kabul, uh, uh, and here a lot of women were coming from other parts of the country to capital Kabul where they can have a little fair education with better quality, a little more safety, and also um, a little more opportunity in terms of employment, scholarships like I Find My Way to Camp, to camp, to camp Here, and other things. But rural areas, unfortunately, um, the war continued and the Taliban Soon after, after the 9-11, uh, or soon after the 2021, 20, uh, the Taliban insurgencies began from different parts of the country. And back then, it was mostly from the southern part of the country, which was mostly the Taliban were active. Schools began to be, um, to be, began to close down, and school teachers began to be um, assassinated, and um, students were killed. There were acid attacks on female workers and everything. But Kabul remained fairly safer for women. And that caught most of the um, Western or Western's attention on women's improvements, on women's jobs. And as the picture showed, unfortunately, this women's circumstances, I think, became very politicized. Uh, now, everyone was fighting on women's narrative. The Taliban were occupying country to oppress women, to make them sit at home, whereas the U.S. was coming Aside from the 9-11 issue, they were mostly coming with this idea of liberating oppressed, quote-unquote, oppressed Afghan women, and how these women uh, should learn about their rights, should learn about their, um, about their capabilities. And, and so these, these two narratives, like very traditional Afghanistan population, mostly, vastly, I should say, and also this narrative of liberation, women's rights, human rights, this created a little bit of contradiction between men and women, and I should say between a lot of families. So people became very much sensitive to women's rights, to human rights, more than human rights, to women's rights. So what do you mean by women's rights? Are you teaching our wives to learn how to say no to their husbands? Are you teaching our wives to learn how to say no to their brothers and to, and to go out and do whatever they do against the cultural code against the honor code of culture society. So that became very negatively accepted by the local traditional people. And so that caused, in fact, so many families, I do not have the statistics, but my research say that a lot of families, in fact, do not want their daughters to go to school, to go to NGOs to work, because they will be taught this poison, they will be poisoned, quote unquote poison, influenced by this woman's rights 
advocates that are coming from the West and mostly they were Americans or Westerners that are Westernizing about women. So that was negative. And also between men and women, there were a lot of tension. Gender. Gender, it's not only women. And in Afghanistan, it was in a way accepted that gender was related to women. Women's representation, unfortunately, I'm sad to say, became very much symbolic because through women, a lot of NGOs were getting money. Government was getting money. Government was attracting international donors' attention and international support to some extent. And women were in the government, yes, in high-ranking positions. I'm, and I'm not saying all of them. The majority of those were unfortunately were, were having the symbolic positions and they were, they were treated as a symbol just to make them um, appear in the media rather than as a woman and see them in their skills and knowledge. Um, for the record, the cartoon that was uh, shown on the screen is not uh, part of the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies, just to be clear in this. Uh, Professor Jaroni, um, at the beginning of uh, the talk, I gave this statistic about the number of casualties. And more uh, Afghan military and police were killed than the Taliban by about 18,000. Mm -hmm. And then uh, everybody was surprised when the Taliban came to power. I wasn't because I was following the story in, uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, I want to focus on the internal dynamics of what happened. Forget about what, uh, uh, forget about the Doha negotiations between the U.S. and the Taliban that started under President Trump and then was followed by President Biden. Forget about the U.S. role. Uh, we can have another program about that important topic. I want to focus on the internal dynamics. So the question I have for you is, how did they come to power? After 20 years, considering the fact, that's the key, because a lot of people forget this, considering the fact that we got there, we got to Afghanistan after 9-11, 2001, precisely because the Taliban had a symbiotic relationship with Al-Qaeda. We went there, we toppled the Taliban, and now after 20 years, they're back. Explain to the audience in, in a few minutes, how, how did they make it? What is it that we don't understand about the Taliban? Explain it to us, please. Okay. Um, Afghan politics from the 1980s on, with the help of outsiders, um, extremely politicized identities, particularly tribal identities and ethnic identities, so that the society was totally divided uh, within itself. Pashtuns against non-Pashtuns particularly became very dominant. The other very important thing that you have to remember, during the 20 years that Taliban came into power, uh, obviously Bonn was one of the places where they also divided uh, government uh, portfolios along ethnic lines. And there were ethnic entrepreneurs who essentially got into the government and uh, abused their power as much as they could. There was wheelings and dealings of all sorts going on during the last 20 years. But one important thing is that the government in Kabul, both during Karzai era as well as Ghani era, were not interested in fighting the Taliban. In many instances, they knew where the Taliban were. The question was that they were calling them uh, disgruntled brothers, particularly Karzai. And both of them were not interested, in fact, not allowing, in many instances, the international forces to go into places where the enemy was located and destroy them because they were members of their own ethnic group. That this dynamic of not allowing um, the uh, military to go and fight uh, the enemy was part of the problem. One of the other things that happened, the United States decided to create private army in, in um, Afghanistan. 
Afghanistan never had private, uh, private armies. They were always based on draft. Everybody was 20 years old. Every male had to serve two years. Of course, it was difficult to bring draft right after the Taliban were overthrown. So they introduced this volunteer army. And guess what happened? The poorest of Afghanistan, particularly non-Pashtun ethnic groups from the north, northeast, got recruited into the 20, 150 or $200 per month salary. So they were going there and fighting. A lot of them were really not very well trained, well equipped. They were, uh, and not only that, the army that and the security force of 350,000 uh, men, in fact, costing around $4 billion a year to the United States taxpayers, a lot of them became ghosts. They didn't exist. The, the uh, um, administration essentially siphoned off the money. They would report that they have so many people here and there, but in fact, those people didn't exist. They got the money and uh, pocketed it. So this was, to, to some extent, we had some problem with the uh, existence, training, equipment, and so forth of the, the army. At the same time, the army was not really, um, there were some really good commandos who were willing to fight, but they were not allowed to fight. Towards the end, part of the problem was that uh, Mr. Khalilzad uh, from Doha wanted the president, Ashraf Ghani, to resign so that they could create a transitional administration made up of Taliban and non-Taliban. And Ghani was not willing to do that. He was insisting that he needed to serve his time out. He had been just elected, and we know the uh, election was a fraud, uh, most of the uh, cases, and Ghani did not want to do that. So the reports are that uh, Zalman Khalilzad would call uh, commanders in various parts of the country, particularly in rural areas, and asking them not to fight and let the Taliban take over the cities and command structures and so on and so forth. And I think Ghani is said to have been hoping that Americans would allow him support him uh, not to uh, allow Kabul to fall. So what happened was that Ghani uh, came to a realization that the Americans were not going to support him for his wish to continue to stay in power. So once he realized that, he also did the same thing. It was sort of the last kick that he could give to international community, to his opponents and so forth, but at the same time also pursue his ethnic project, which was the Pashtuns had to come into power and Taliban were the Pashtuns who could come to power. So he also called up the, the same thing that uh, um, Khalilzad were doing. He did it as well. He called uh, some of the commanders and told them, don't fight, let the Taliban take over. And then finally, I think there was uh, something going on within the Khalij, within the Gulf region, between the Qataris and the UAE and uh, Saudis and so forth. So, uh, and I think uh, the, the Dubai community, the EUA community did not want the Qataris to essentially win in their project of uh, uh, sec being successful in, in uh, creating a transitional government with Taliban you know, winning as is, is it were, and uh, they wanted to undermine that. So something was worked out. Ashraf Ghani essentially fled the country to UAE and that collapsed the prospects for the creation of a transitional government and possibly peace of some kind. And uh, the Qatari project essentially got collapsed and the country fell very suddenly, immediately to the hands of the Taliban and Taliban Pashtuns. In other words, the, the, the project of Pashtunization of politics in the country that had been going on under Khaliza, under um, uh, Karzai and Ghani essentially succeeded. And the ones who lost in the process are basically the non-Pashtun ethnic groups, the, the uh, Farsi Ban or Tajiks and Persian speakers in general and the Turkic speakers and the Hazaras. Hazaras are particularly left out. They are, and women of course are completely excluded from the current government. It's a government that is entirely of Taliban and 17 out of 33 members of their temporary or transitional cabinet are people who are in the blacklist 
of the United Nations as international terrorists. And seven, six or seven of them were the Haqqani uh, family members, including Siraj al-Din Haqqani himself, who is the Minister of Interior. So that we have this government of terrorists, essentially, that is um, brought to the country. And of course, they are the ones who are, who are st uh, stepping on the back of the Afghan woman, is, is the cartoon uh, showed. I'm sorry if it was uh, not sensitive to some people, but uh, that's, uh, again, a cartoon that an American cartoonist has drawn. It's not uh, uh, our job. It's right here in America. In America, some Americans are very frustrated about what happened in Afghanistan, especially given the fact that 800,000 Americans served in that country, and some of them were um, concerned about uh, the consequences of their efforts. And what you pointed out, that $2.3 trillion of our taxpayers' money also is spent there with this particular outcome. Um, I'll get back to you in a second. Let me uh, go to uh, Dr. Nuru. And uh, for the past uh, 100 or, uh, what is it, 120 days, 130 days since uh, the withdrawal of U.S. forces and takeover of of the country by the Taliban. I'm pretty sure you're in contact with your friends and your family members. Uh, please uh, give us a personal account of what you hear about the status of women, about the status of civil society in Afghanistan under the Taliban rule. The Taliban haven't consolidated power yet. Or they're trying to. And as far as I am concerned, uh, unless Taliban agree to an all exclusive, inclusive uh, government that consists of all major ethnic groups, Tajik, the Uzbeks, the Azaras, women, uh, etc., we are not going to see a uh, long period of stability. I want to focus more on the personal account, something that we don't hear about. I think you made an excellent point about those 20 years of American patient of Afghanistan being the golden years of Afghanistan. Freedom of the press, freedom of expression. So, Tell us what happened. Exclusive. No, has it all collapsed? Because if it all has collapsed, it means nothing was institutional, official, superficial. I, yes, I am in touch with family. Yes, I am in touch with friends, friends who have been highly involved with um, government and also civil society, they are shut, and I do not want to risk their lives by my contacts, my phone. So I will, I, I, I let them be safe wherever they are. I personally, when I look back um, in the time that I used to work as a single woman, I used to travel alone in the provinces with my male colleagues. But as a government official, I was picked up by my driver and dropped off in my office where I worked, where I did what I could, and all looks like a dream for me. And now what's happening, it sounds like a long lasting nightmare, as if it's not going away, as if it's just, it's just sucking our blood. And we keep getting up with nightmares each night, every single night, and every day you think that it's not real, how it happened. Now, the Taliban, first they announced their cabinet, of course, it's all men, it's all Taliban. And we had the only minister, which was very unpopular minister of uh, women's ministry. And that got replaced with vice and virtue. So what does vice and virtue mean? So when it comes to religion, unfortunately, and it's not only Islam, in the all religious religion, I think, when it comes to religion, women becomes the, the key player. And the religion is mostly exercised on women. 
mostly seen on, on women. And there's always double standards between men and women. And the same case applied, um, applies in Afghanistan. The vice and virtue usually looks on women, how women dress, how women walk, how women behave in society, how women behave in families. So essentially, they are, they, there is a ministry that actually, um, in their term, um, to, to manage women, women is present in public, even if they are under the burqa, even if they are not going to education, even if they are not contributing anything in the society. They just watch them, this vice and virtue ministry, how they are doing, what they are doing, and, and how, in what ways they are portraying themselves in public so the man cannot be, um, you know, orgasmic, excuse my language, by their presence. So that's, that's what they want. Now, in the, in the past 100 or 100 plus days, those brave women, there are some brave women, and I, and, I, and, I, and I admire their courage. They are going out with their signs in small numbers and larger numbers with their flags, and they are speaking up. But they, 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 there was retaliation on how women been treated and how they, um, the Taliban um, uh, responded to them with, with violence. So it has been very difficult. Now, again, when, this, when we say the Taliban um, treating women, from my information from family and friends, they are treating women differently in Kabul than in provinces. Now, when it comes to provinces, again, they are treating women from provinces to provinces. As, as far as I, uh, as I remember my communication from friends, in provinces where minorities are located, they treat women very harshly. Now, part of my family lives, uh, lives in, the, in the Northeast. I talk to them weekly or once in two weeks, and they are, they are getting lashed by the Taliban, even, when, even if they are wearing the blue burqa. Even the skin of the ankle is showing up, the Taliban come with their lashes, and then suddenly they lash in their ankle. Where is your man? My man is not here. I don't have a man. Who do you want me to walk with? Do you want me to walk with another man on the street, which is not my mahram? I can do that if you allow me. That's my sister's response to the Taliban. But that's how they have been treating. I think in the provinces, particularly provinces with minority populations, are worse than other provinces and in Kabul. I, 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 do, I do want to add some, some points about Dr. Shahrani mentioned earlier, um, but I think I'm, I'm good with my time, so please move on. Uh, let me make one point very clear. I am not in communication with devil in my cell phone. I am in communication with people who are sending me questions before I'm reading those. <laughs> Polite. Um, Dr. Shahrani, uh, I know you're an anthropologist, a good one. So I try to uh, question more political than anything else. And I know it is going to be very difficult to talk about the future, especially with the Taliban, because so many uh, moving variables about the future of the country. But how do you, where do you see Afghanistan moving, say, in the next five years? I think five years is as far as I want to go. Mm. What are I, what what are the uh, fault lines you see? What are the important signs that we have to pay attention to to mm -hmm. find out where that country, the direction that that country is taking? Okay, the uh, Taliban are, I think, going to be in trouble before too long. Right now, all they are focusing on is uh, international recognition. They are not paying any attention to internal demands and dynamics of the population for inclusive governance, for rights, for inclusion of uh, women. All of the things that people inside want is not being looked at, or even they are not taking responsibility for uh, the condition of uh, poverty that they have brought to the society. Two, three days ago, uh, their Prime Minister, or the equivalent of Prime Minister, Mullah Hassan, who was apparently companion of Mullah Omar in the old days, uh, finally broke his silence and gave a sermon. A sermon was like speaking in a mosque in a village. 
not in address to the nation or international community outlining what Taliban uh, plans are for the country or for the future. So there is opposition growing in the country against the Taliban. And Taliban are also busy essentially approaching um, uh, to the uh, requ uh, demands of uh, China in Russia and to some extent Iran that uh, they, are, they are presenting this um, uh, Daesh is a major problem in that uh, no country is going to suffer from any insecurity coming out of Afghanistan. This is their sort of mantra. And uh, if Chinese and Russians are, and they are the ones who are becoming spokesmen along with Pakistan, that America should uh, release their frozen funds and this and that. And of course, international community, fortunately, in the last uh, three months, have not been willing to extend recognition, formal recognition to them. But at the same time, they're trying very hard to help the people of Afghanistan, the poor and the needy, and all these um, hundreds of thousands of Afghans who used to work for the government, whether in education and healthcare and uh, everything, they have not been paid their salaries for the last three, four months, because even the old regime apparently did not pay a number of them. So that people are starving. People have sold their belongings. Uh, Kabul city has become a sort of a old clothing and old furniture store. In every street corner, people are selling what they have. And they are beginning to say that uh, what we sold everything and it's run out. So what is going to happen? And Taliban are doing Nothing. This uh, Mullah Hassan Akhund actually was saying this is something from Allah. This is the, the, the you know, you have to be a uh, risk comes uh, from Allah. And if you don't have your risk, so be it. Be content and pray that uh, God has given us this power and we've come here and we're bringing security. This is this is a false representation. They were the cause of insecurity in the country for the last at least 14 years. And they are now claiming they brought security. So if they were the cause of insecurity and they have stopped uh, insecurity, they obviously there is going to be a security because they were the cause of it. So they have not brought anything. They just have stopped doing what they were doing against their own people. But they are now doing it. Uh, they have brought conditions against their own people that are uh, detrimental to the survival of the nation. And there is a national resistance uh, growing, and it's led by Ahmad Masoud, the son of Ahmad Shah Masoud, the hero of the nation. And I think that's growing. People are organizing themselves by this that there will be major resistance against the Taliban. And the Taliban is, is not going to be allowed to continue until international community is going to help them in some way to, to survive. Otherwise, they have no support in the people. People are uh, hateful of them. They are running away. Hundreds of thousands have, have fled the country and others are, if the borders were closed, I mean open, they would be fleeing the country either for work or for otherwise to Iran, through Iran and uh, Central Asian countries. That's part of the problem that, that uh, uh, people fleeing and becoming uh, essentially immigrants uh, and fleeing is refugees, fleeing is refugees and flooding Europe and uh, Indian subcontinent or Pakistan is part of the problem that, that people are fearing. And um, that's, that's the reality. But Taliban will have short lifespan, I hope. Dr. Shahrani, when he is talking about uh, Masood, he's talking about uh, Northern Alliance. Uh, Northern Alliance was the main opposition group to the Taliban rule. And uh, when the American forces decided to get rid of the Taliban, they cooperated and they collaborated with the Northern Alliance. And it was through that collaboration. Taliban were overthrown. Uh, at, that time, at that time, Northern Alliance received uh, generous support, financial, military support from three countries, Russia, India, and Iran. And during the Taliban's rule, 
Only three countries recognize their despicable government. Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and United Arab Emirates. So that uh, our audience. Dr. Nehru, uh, there is a question here. One of my students is asking, uh, you indicated that uh, before some 95% of women were not, were whales. What do you think is the percentage now after 20 years of American stay in Afghanistan? And do you think uh, the Taliban today are different than the Taliban that ruled uh, Afghanistan 20 years ago? Okay, two parts of your question. The first part, uh, or the second part, let me begin with that. Today's Taliban, as, as far as I encountered with communicating with my family and also seeing all the horrible news reports, news that are coming from my beloved country, no, they haven't changed. How they present themselves, they have changed is just to get the international attention, just to give a recognition globally so they could have more support. Otherwise, how do they run the country, as Dr. Shahroni um, explained earlier? So those only who say we have changed, three men sitting in front of the cameras and sitting in media room and giving media brief. That's it. Now, they, they, are, they are looking the same uh, barbarians as they were once in the past. They are treating the same way as they did in the past, especially in the Northeast, in the corner of the, the country. And also, they are, they, are, they are just knocking the doors of anyone they want in the Northeast specifically. Give us food. Give us this. Give us that. Now, what, do you, what do you want? Now, next, next day, they may ask, give me your daughter. What the family will do? And yes, there has been report of forcing by marrying uh, the young girls of minority families by force to their soldiers. So no, we do not know, at least local people, at least people I talk in the country, they do not see one single point of change in the Taliban. In Kabul, yes, there are, there are men with the same by um, horrifying uh, appearances um, standing each on each side of the street. They are trying to protect people, but they are in, in fact um, the real threat for people. So no, I do not see weak or my personal opinion, I do not see any changes. And the second point, I think I cannot give any percentage after the 20 years of the international community's involvement, how many women got educated, got education, or became involved in public. But the percentage were, again, compared to the overall population of the country or female population of the country, it was not much, unfortunately. It was not much, yes. Yes, um, women like me got scholarships in different universities and pursued their education abroad. If they, they did not want to, they stayed and they got married, they have their family. But I think overall, um, yes, it did. It did bring a vibrant demand for women. At least women feel that if I wanted, I could do that. There was an option for them. At least that was there. But now they do not have any option. That is the sad part. And women are imprisoned in the houses. Yes, they are calling women to come to work, but not all women. They laid off a municipality. A lot of women were working in municipality, and those women were the poorest of poor. The poorest of poor that there had there was no job for them. They went to municipality. They were brushing and cleaning the streets outside, and they are eating with a piece of bread and tea under the tree. Now those women are set at home. Imagine what happened to their family. What happens to their kid that's newborn? All right, before you answer the second part of the question, because I haven't forgotten, uh, Dr. Shahrani raised his hand. Yes, I want to add that um, about three and a half million girls have been in schools in recent times. And of course, this is over the 20 year that has uh, grown into this size. And it's also very important that this, the country has become more urbanized than it ever were. Kabul, at the time when um, uh, Tabassum was talking about earlier on before the uh, communist coup, I lived in Kabul. And my classmates were wearing miniskirts. 
with Kabul was only about 100,000 people, population, and only the elite girls were doing that. Kabul is now six to seven million people. And a lot of other cities have grown. And it's in these cities where people have become um, acquainted with freedoms and have also begun to express their freedoms. And one or the other very important thing that we have to remember, Afghanistan is one of the youngest nations demographically. Between 65 to 70 percent of the population of that country are below the age of 25. And it's this youthfulness of the country and access to education, access to facilities that were made available in the last 20 years, I think has changed both men and women in the country. And the youth are essentially going to be the biggest force against Taliban's rule. They are not going to tolerate. And that's, I think, what has made Taliban to behave uh, a little softly, or at least speaking softly, while they are doing on the sly terrible things to some people in different parts of the country. Thank you. Now, would you like to answer the second part of the question? Yeah. So I think USA estimated that by um, 2023, there would be. 100,000 female students in higher education. And that was a big achievement when in 2001, there was zero achievement. That has definitely changed lives. And all of those higher education, of course, they moved along. They pursued different jobs, different occupations, and we had a great number of women representing other women, um, making different laws for women. We have a number of uh, policies international policies that Afghanistan also joined, and they were for the outcome of, of the women's hard work to join and to champion for women's rights and also banning marriage um, earlier than 18 years old. Um, that was, that was uh, the, the, the outcome of um, their activities. It did change lives. Uh, but overall, if you say, I can give you a specific um, percentage because it keeps fluctuating. I don't want to mislead you by the by the by what I read and I gave it to you. So I apologize for that. That's quite all right. Uh, I have this question from uh, Mr. Ted Wilhite, member of our board. It says, should we be fearful that the Taliban have hidden the refugees that come to America? Either one of you can. I didn't get the question. What was the question? The... Should the U.S. should we be fearful that the Taliban might have hidden the refugees that either mm. have come or are planning to come to America? Yes, I think we should be um, concerned, not fearful, but at least concerned, and also process and examine closely. Because I have heard stories that some Taliban soldier even, uh, as they were uh, guarding those streets in crowds and whatnot, left their guns behind and uh, uh, sort of tagged themselves into a family saying, if you take me with you and, you know, count me as a member of your family and so forth, that they, it has happened. That some of them may have, in fact, in, infiltrated purposefully. Uh, or unintentionally. And I think it's important that, that uh, those who have come to the United States should be uh, scrutinized closely uh, to see uh, that, that they're not going to be causing any trouble in the country. I would add uh, a little differently than Dr. Shahrani. I think hearing the refugee crisis a few, a few days ago, like, um, it really, it really made me emotional. And I think the refugee policies across the world is so harsh. And smugglers find their ways anyway. And I think these harsher policies make the smugglers richer and they produce more smugglers, more human traffickers. Um, instead of, I think, focusing on, on the refugees
but I would say instead of that, uh, have a clear and open, slightly softer policies to refugees. So if they come, they do not come as threats. And if you're making it harsher and harsher, that's why they are they are finding different ways ways to find a way to to these countries, and that's why some of them become threats. Do we have I either one of either one of you can answer this? Do we have an accurate estimate of how many Afghans have already left the country, either going to the West or as a refugees? Do we have any idea of how many? I think uh, America, yeah, America uh, has been saying that they have uh, retrieved 124,000 during the operation but they have not released any more statistics what happened after that. We, know, we hear on the Afghan media that um, uh, 10,000 people at least uh, each day try to cross uh, the borders into Iran. And very large numbers have in fact crossed over to Iran and some of them have reached Turkey. How many goes to Pakistan is not said, but I think very large numbers are also going into Pakistan. So I would say probably at least half a million may have been uh, uh, out of the country and more would be willing to do that if the opportunities were there. One thing that I have to um, mention, I think, in what Tabassum said, the policies uh, of uh, refugees coming to the United States or Europe are very, very different. And when they reach here will take years if they can get here. The major policies have to do really with the neighboring countries. The northern neighbors are not allowing. They are very, very strict. Uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, uh, they have uh, sort of a military policy essentially uh, guarding their borders and not allowing. So Iran is the only area in Pakistan that are open. China, of course, is impossible for anybody from that uh, 70 kilometer border. I know there is one pass over 16,500 feet high uh, and Chinese have sealed that off so nobody can really go to China. Uh, so that's, I think we don't have a real statistics, but the estimate would be probably close to half a million yeah. in the last few months. Yeah. Um, we have about uh, seven or eight more minutes. And we have one more question. Either one of you can answer because it's uh, perhaps you can divide it up. It's from uh, Christopher. Uh, what demands uh, are China, Russia, and Iran making of the Taliban government? Mm -hmm. Is any country in the region advocating for better conditions for the people of Afghanistan? Either one of you can uh, well, answer. That. If you allow me, I mean, Tabasum, go ahead. If you have something to say, I do have some some responses. I wanted to say you are the expert to talk about it, but I think the narrative I hear is it, it, it's just uh, uh, my sister who always uses this, this this expression whenever I call. Well, Afghanistan is the land, the the football ground. What is that called in English? It's well, Afghanistan is the football ground, and to some extent, I think it makes sense to say that. And she, it, she's not the only one who says that. A lot of Afghan people say that. So it's the, it, Afghanistan has been between the superpowers. It has been in the past and, and to date it continues. China is a superpower and the US is a superpower. So it's just a war between these two. And, and that war impacts the local people and mostly women more than anyone else. The politicians play their games and they do not get any, any um, impact by that. But the impact is on the local people. So hopefully, at some point of the history, the superpowers can realize that in fact that they are damaging this land, this people, this land and the history and the culture and everything they have. So it has been enough, I think. The concern of China and Russia are somewhat different. The Russians are concerned essentially uh, about drug smuggling and uh, other sorts of illegal activities and also the concern that Central Asian countries would be this, um, destabilized. And that will, of course, affect uh, Russian economy, society, and so forth. The Chinese are much bigger problem. Chinese are already 
incarcerated, have incarcerated more than 2 million Uyghurs. And they have turned Islam illegal in China. Nobody can practice, pray, or demonstrate in any form or fashion that they are Muslims. And that they know there are a couple of thousand Uyghur Muslim resistance fighters who have been fighting along, because of necessity, along Taliban for years in Afghanistan on their side. And that they were moved um, for varieties of reasons into northeastern Afghanistan, closer to Chinese borders and close to the Tajikistan borders. And that China has put pressure on Taliban to remove those from Badakhshan province, closest to China, further into Takhar, into Tabasan's province, not mine, and maybe further west. The challenge here is that the, the Taliban are going to be giving in to the Chinese what they will do to these Uyghurs, the 2000 Uyghurs, we don't know, but one of them was involved in the suicide bombing in the mosque against the Shias in Qunduz. That he was a Uyghur Muslim. And of course, uh, the chances are that these Uyghurs were being cornered by China and Taliban, and Taliban calling themselves uh, a true Muslims and fighting for Islam and all the rest. Here, again, they compromise. They are not really concerned about religion. It's politics that they're concerned, and it's the tribal politics, ethnic politics that they're concerned about. So that uh, the chances are the Taliban would move against these Uyghurs and that they are very likely to join Daesh. And that's what concerns then uh, the United States, uh, the Russians and the Chinese and so forth. So the Chinese are really playing a very dirty game. Uh, and instead of uh, re uh, relaxing their policies against the Muslims in China. They are playing this game of, you know, we don't uh, interfere anybody's internal politics and nobody are, is allowed to, in, you know, uh, interfere in our internal politics. This is, of course, something that Washington has been concerned. And Washington is also raising these issues uh, in terms of, again, the much larger great game in Central Asia, which has new forms and has taken new form in the region. So Iran is really, Iran's concern is primarily Daesh. And uh, Daesh being extremely anti-Shia. And of course, they also have experienced them in, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the Iranian concern is Daesh. But again, uh, Daesh could be a lot of disgruntled Taliban uh, and very likely even some of the um, old troops within the security force, the 350,000 supposedly that, that had been built. Some of them are reported that already uh, that they may have joined Daesh. So that Daesh could be a, a major problem if it is not, if the Taliban problem is not resolved in an in a amicable way in the near future. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are at the end of our program. I I want to once again thank Dr. Shahrani and Dr. Tabassum Yu for joining me for this very interesting, intriguing, uh, and enlightening conversation. And I also want to apologize to our audience for some technical problems we had throughout the program. We have a new technical team, and uh, therefore we've run into unexpected uh, technical issues. Hopefully, our next program at the beginning of next year is going to be much cleaner and uh, nicer. Than so. so with this, I wish all of you a happy holidays and thank you again to both of our guests. Have thank a good night and good evening. Thank you very much, Professor Milani. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, too. Yeah. Have a Happy good holidays and good night. Good night.